to have something better to say from the mistakes you've made and how you corrected it and bailed yourself out. And sometimes instead of just registering it in your head, why not commit it to paper so that it gets logged, it gets recorded, and someday you can use it for the future? Have something good to say. The key to speaking well, the key to excellent communications is preparation. Actually, all of our life is preparing. This year, preparing for the next. Those first, what, eight, nine grades preparing for high school, then high school preparing for college, college and university preparing for a career, a career to earn money, then preparing to make the investments to keep you safe and secure, build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Always preparing for those steps and stages in our life. That's part of the game of life. For humans, it seems like it takes us longer to prepare. When the little wildebeest is born, it only has about one hour to get ready to run with the herd and escape the lions. One hour. So the little wildebeest, as soon as it's born, tries to stand up, falls down. Its mother nudges it, stand up, stand up, falls down. Stand up, come on, try again. Why such urgency? The lions... The lions are not very far away. Come on, come on, come on. And within less than an hour, within less than an hour, the little wildebeest, brand new, just born, is now strong enough to run with the herd and escape the lions. Less than an hour. Human babies take a little longer. After 17 years, we're not quite sure <laughs> they can escape all the lions and have a safe place to go. So preparation, getting ready, sometimes seems so laborious. After going to grade one, now you got to go to grade two. After grade two, it's grade three. Will it never end? Come on, one more grade, grade four, and then five. Wow, seems like it takes us forever to finally get ready, you know, to design a life and get married and have a family and a career and fortune and future. But it takes preparation. Now, to communicate well, here's some good words to prepare for communication. Number one, interest. Just keep your interest alive in people and places. That's why, you know, a big share of my job takes me around the world countries all around the world, you know, from Africa to Asia to South America to uh, Australia to Russia to the Far East, um, Israel. The last time I was in Israel, there was some kind of an alert. We were all on the airplane. We all had to get off the airplane. They took off all of our luggage, and we go ahead, each one of us had to go identify our piece of luggage and put it back on the airplane and then we took off. Wow. Taking what? No chances. If you'll develop an interest in all of that, when it's right side up and when it's upside down, take a keen interest in the politics of the day and the speeches and all that's happening that gives you good stuff to debate and decide. Where do you stand on the major issues? Not only the political issues, but the major life issues. Be that kind of, be that interested in life and people. So underline the word life and people. That's the whole study. Life, study life in all of its twists and turns. Study people in all of their variety. In being in an enterprise that, you know, where you have to employ people, get people to work with you, that's a challenge. Different ages, different, different opinions, different personalities, different temperaments. Here's one of the skills I learned that paid me big money. Getting people to work together and see if they're all different in a whole variety. How do you get them all to work together? I'm telling you, it's not easy. It is a challenge, organizing, getting people to work together. But the pay, the paycheck, it's unbelievable. 
Now, if you're working with independent people, then it really is challenging. It's like herding cats. <laughs> Did you ever try that? Herding sheep is easy. They all quickly get going the same direction, very quickly. Cats? No way. If you've got eight cats, how many directions are they going? Eight different directions. But if you can master herding cats, I promise you, a paycheck like you cannot believe. <laughs> Here's what's interesting about people. The ones who should do it the most are inclined the least. How come they can't see it? I don't know. I can see it. They can't see it. Maybe right now they're not supposed to see it. That, that's the best I said. Sometimes you just got to take the easier way out. I don't know. That's an easier way out than to try to explain it all. That's just the way it is. Somebody you thought was going to stay, they leave. Here's what you have to learn to say. Isn't that interesting? Wow. And somebody that you thought was going to leave, what? They stay and you say, I wouldn't have thought that in a hundred years. There's a surprise a day waiting for you, working with people. And then some people are nice and some people are not so nice. But there's only a few. When I first started in sales, Mr. Shoup, my mentor, said, here's the good news, Mr. Rohn. There's only nine or ten real nasty, miserable, horrible people in the world. That's what he said. Now he said they move around a lot. <laughs> and you're liable to get one once in a while. But when you do, you just say, hey, there's only nine more like you. I can handle that the rest of my life. So that was really good. And then sometimes you got to try a little wit and a little humor. That helps. When I first started traveling with Mark Hughes and Herbalife 21 years ago, one of my friends said to me, I heard some people died using that product. And I said, not that many. <laughs> Now, it was a silly comment that he made, so I had to think up a silly answer. You can't give a, you know, a, an honest answer, you know, a good answer to a silly comment. I said, I understand as long as the deaths are under 100 a month, they get to keep selling the product. <laughs> if the numbers go over 100, they have to come in for a review. Now, that was all silly nonsense, but he deserved it, right? His silly comment. I don't know. Use a little humor. Somebody says, this isn't going to work for me. Say it was designed not to work for some people. <laughs> I don't know. What, what do I know? <laughs> Too bad that's you. <laughs> you know, what can I say? I'm not a genius to figure this stuff out. The best wit in the world was Winston Churchill, right? Lady Astor in the English Parliament exasperated one day with Winston Churchill. She said, Winston, if you were my husband, I'd put poison in your coffee. He said, Lady Astor, if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> now, whatever it takes. Don't let anybody put you down. Be a student of life and people and all the varieties and what's happening in the world. It's an interesting place to live. And while you're here, learn all you can, study all you can. Right. The varieties, some people are easy and some are miserable. Just learn how to handle all that. Here's the next word to communicate well, and that's fascination. It goes the step beyond just interest. Be like a child, fascinated with everything. Next, sensitivity. Trying to understand where people are, where they're coming from, the position they might be in at the moment. Trying to understand a night visits us all after days and some winters are tough and some people are having tough times. Be sensitive to all that. Next is simply knowledge. Just gather every idea you can that makes you a better communicator. I came up with this back in those early days when I was talking to service clubs and you know, once in a while a high school class and a college class and making those little speeches. I come up with this little speech. Here it is. I'll give you the notes on it. It's called The Four Ifs That Make Life Worthwhile. 
the four ifs. And if you're looking to make a little speech, you know these notes might serve you well. Here was the first if. Life is worthwhile if you learn. You gotta know, you gotta have the information. When I talk to the kids in school, that's what I say. Get the information while you're here. What you're gonna do with it, that's up to you. Throw it all away, that's up to you. Just use a little of it, that's up to you. But while you're here, get it all. Right? There's nothing worse than being stupid. <laughs> being broke is bad, but being stupid is really bad. So get the information. What's really, really bad is being broke and stupid. <laughs> nothing worse than that. Unless you're sick. <laughs> that would do it. Sick, broken, stupid. <laughs> That's about as far as you can fall, unless you're ugly. <laughs> But surely, that's the ultimate negative life. Ugly, sick, broken, stupid. <laughs> that is it. So you got to know. you got to have the information. So jot this down now, as I used in my notes. What you don't know will hurt you. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is tragedy. Ignorance is illness. Ignorance is devastation. Ignorance is going broke. Ignorance is, creates a poor life. So you got to know, you got to have the information. Number one, learn from your personal experience. One way to learn to do it right is first mess it up and do it wrong. That doesn't mean it's the end of your life, but just, you know, clean up the mess. Now do it right. From a negative experience, sometimes we learn to do the positive things that saves our life and makes us successful. They say, if you survive your first heart attack... If you survive, you may now live to be a very old person. Why is that? That first heart attack was a wake-up call. And then maybe the doctor said, another one of these in your history. And you say, wow. And you make it for the health food store. And you start reading every book you can read on health and nutrition. And you start doing the push-ups and you start jogging on the beach and doing all the stuff. And all of that change now could very well help you to live a long, long life. Having been alerted in an alarm system that serves you well. Okay? So learn from your negative as well as your positive experiences. Here's the next. Learn from other people's experiences. That's how you get smarter in a shorter period of time. Somebody that's been through it for five years and they wrote a book? And the book, if you read it, could save you five years? Cost $30? So you just, you can't miss that kind of education. Best to get the information before. Yes, we can recover. Yes, we can come back, you know, from the grave, practically. Yes, we can come back from bankruptcy and disaster and poor health. But wow, if we had the information up front that would save us some of those years of disaster, how much better that would be. So learn from other people's experiences, both negative and positive. In the seminar I do for Jerry, here's what I say. Two bad failures don't give seminars. We don't want to pay them so they don't give seminars. But their information would be valuable. If a guy's messed up his life for 40 years, you just have to say, John, would you spend a day with me? <laughs> and I'll bring my notes, notebook and take good notes. Good-looking guy like you, beautiful family, every reason to do well, and you threw it all away. Teach me for a day how you messed it all up. <laughs> right? And you just take good notes so that the same thing doesn't happen to you. So, learn from your experience, learn from other people's experiences. Okay. If you learn, life is worthwhile. Here's the second if. If you try, you've got to now try something from what you've learned. We've talked about that now earlier. Take action. You never know. My father said you never know until you try. 
if we put the bar up two feet and ask the kids to jump over the bar two feet high, what will the kids say? Some will say, no, I can't. Some will say, easy. Some will say, what? I don't know. So how are we going to find out for everybody? You got to take a run at it and see if you can jump the two feet. So you got to try it to see who knows. You don't know. What if you try to knock the bar down? Does that mean you cannot jump two feet? No. You try it, what? Again. Then somebody shows you a little technique, right? Leave the ground a little earlier. Okay. First thing you know, two feet is easy, when before you couldn't or didn't think you could. So you got to try it. Giving speeches and doing talks. Age 25, I stand up to give my first little training. My mind sat back down. <laughs> I open my mouth and nothing comes out. My knees are knocking like this. The sweat is pouring. It's called terror, in case you haven't tried it, right? <laughs> but I got through it somehow. It was so bad, if I hadn't have been doing the class, I'd have gone home, right? <laughs> it was bad. I'm so happy you were not there. You would not have paid this kind of money for my first presentation. Wow. But I got through it, and then I did it again. You know, I didn't know if I should even try again. But sure enough, I had the kind of mentor and the kind of teacher who said, hey, that's nothing. You know, what if you go up to bat and you strike out? Does that mean it's over? Say, no, it's not over. It's just over for one time up at bat. And then another time and another time, pretty soon you connect. And pretty soon you get good enough to do well. And then pretty soon you get good enough to win the game. And then pretty soon you get good enough to take home the trophy. So you just keep trying. The third if that makes life worthwhile is if you stay. You've got to hang in there. Some people plant in the spring and leave in the summer when it gets a little hot and a little uncomfortable and it looks like the weeds are winning and it looks like the bugs are having a feast and you have a tendency to say, hey, I've had it with this. But the key is if you want the harvest in the fall at harvest time, you've got to stay through the summer. Even if the harvest doesn't turn out to be good, you just see it through and then use that experience to do better planting in the spring come the next turnaround of seasons. So stay in there. If you're going to play the game, you've got to stay until it's over. What if the team was, you were on the team and you guys were behind and you said, hey, we're so far behind, we're out of here. And you all walked off the court, right? We would run you out of town probably. We wouldn't own you as the home team. Say, I'm behind, so I'm out of here. No, you stay until what? It's over. We're not talking about a lifetime now. We're just talking about this game. If you're in it, stay till it's over. Who are these people who leave as spectators before the game is over? Because their team is behind. Our team is behind, we're out of here. What if the team said that? Who are these people that walk, you know, push and shove, spill popcorn and Coke down your neck, leaving early? Who are these people? They're the ones that are saying, we're going to beat the traffic. Oh, that's one of the greatest skills on earth, is beating the traffic, leaving your team that's behind to fend for themselves. Goodbye. We're out of here. We're gone. No. If you sign up for the game, you don't have to go to every game. But the one you sign up, you stay. Right? You don't have to do everything every time. But when you start it, see it through. See the seasons through. Then you don't have to plant anymore if you don't want to. But when you do sign up, go. Go the, go the distance. Here's a guy who builds a foundation, and then he walks off and leaves it. Puts up no walls, no roof, doesn't finish anything. He's got these foundations scattered all across the country. Foundations, foundations. I asked a friend of mine, I said, Jim, what are you good at? He said, starting over. That's my specialty, right? He said, hey, if it doesn't work, I don't stay long. No, come on. See it through. Life is worthwhile if you stay. Hang in there. 
Next, life is worthwhile if you care. And for my little talk for the service clubs, here's how I wound it up. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you can get extraordinary results. If you just care at all, you'll get some. But if you really cultivate your caring character and care enough, you can have such extraordinary returns from productivity, activity, things you're doing underway. Okay. Have something good to say. Here's the next one. Under communication. Now we must learn to say it well. Once you've got something, now you can't mumble. If you've got something good to say, you can't mumble. Right? It's got to be clear. Or no matter how good the message is that you've got to deliver, how good the instructions, how good the ideas, no matter how good they are, if you don't deliver them well, now the power is lost and the opportunity is lost. So number one is to have something good to say, and number two is to say it well. Here's what will help you to say it well. Make this list. Number one, sincerity. If a message is delivered with sincerity, see, that makes all the difference. If the speaker is sincere, if the father is sincere, if the mother is sincere, see, that's captivating for the children. If, if, the, if the friend is sincere, even covering a delicate subject for us of some changes we probably should make, if they're sincere, see, we will give them room. Perhaps to get on our case if we know they're sincere, not just trying to criticize for criticizing's sake. If your sincerity, I'm telling you, that wins the day. Here's what can really be accomplished. Hopefully, like this weekend here, someone sincerely willing to speak and someone sincerely willing to listen. Now, in terms of lecture, book, seminar, and all the rest, we must come to this conclusion, because it's a wise conclusion, that sincerity is not a test of truth. In your study and evaluating everything, just... Make sure you have that in the back of your mind. Sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make the mistake of saying he must be right. He's so sincere. See, that might be a mistake. Why is that? Here's why. It's possible to be sincerely wrong. So sincerity is not a test of truth. Here's the only test of truth. Truth. Truth is the only test of truth, not sincerity. We hope someone will be both truthful and sincere. But we don't mistake sincerity for truth. Here's next. Repetition. To get better at something, you just have to go do it. Go do it. Accept every opportunity to go make a little talk if that's going to be your business. Get better at talking to your kids. Come up with more illustrations. Come up with more ideas. Read an extra book, how to communicate with teenagers. So you'll have something a little better to say. And then just practice it. Get good at it. Get better at it. Right? I was clumsy when I started. Now the words flow a little easier. I still struggle with the language, trying to make it clear. But it's easier now. Repetition has helped me to do that. Here's what's next. In good communication, saying it well, brevity. Right? Don't take too long to say it if you can say it in shorter sentences and shorter time. One way to learn brevity is to talk to kids. <laughs> you talk to kids for 30 seconds and they say, how long is this going to take? <laughs> It's already too long, right? 30 seconds. I mean, they got games to play and things to do. They can't hang around for, you know, an hour's discourse. So talk to kids. It helps you to make it more brief. Powerful, but brief. Well said, but, you know, more brief. The storyteller tells us Jesus wandered around the countryside in putting his 12 together that was going to start this whole new movement. 
And as he wandered around the countryside, every once in a while he would say, you, follow me. See, that's short. <laughs> that's no hour presentation with the fancy lights and, you know, all. No, just you, follow me. Why could he be so brief and so short with that simple appeal? Jot this down now. Probably for who he was, not just for what he said, but for who he was. There was something about him when he said, you follow me, see. Probably his reputation, probably his manner, probably with how he said it. Irresistible, you follow me. Wow. So here's what's powerful. And you can talk less and, and even be more effective in this personal development area. The stronger you become and the wiser you become, the more caring you become, it shows in your language and your manner. The texture of your communication changes and reaches where it couldn't reach before. It strikes the heart where it didn't strike before. That's, that's the key here. Next, style. Now, you've got to develop your own style. You can be a student of style. There's about a dozen people that I know over the years that if you knew those dozen, you'd say, hey, you know, a little bit of each of them appears in Jim Rohn's style, which is probably true. Not copying any one person, but I like the way the person said it this way. I like the word person's gestures, because I used to be a little too stiff without, you know, gestures. Frank Sinatra was the best, not for only his lyrics and his phrasing and his style, but his gestures. His gestures. They were captivating. They were part of his persona. So make this note, not, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Style, sincerity, the way you present it, heart, soul, from deep inside, commitment, dedication, wrapped up in your language so that now when you present it, hey, it becomes incredibly effective. Next is vocabulary. The better your vocabulary, the better you can share ideas that are meaningful. Find words now to use that you couldn't use before. Interesting story on vocabulary. Some friends of mine took a survey among prisoners many, many years ago some rehabilitation program they were working on for prisoners. They weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a connection between vocabulary and behavior. And here's what they discovered. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency to poor behavior. Isn't that interesting? And when you think about it for a while, you can say, well, I can see where that would be. If you were very limited in your ability to comprehend because you had such a small vocabulary, that no matter what someone said, it would still be confusing. No matter what they said, it still might not make sense. They said it clear, but you couldn't see it. And sometimes that's because the vocabulary is so limited that it doesn't have the ability to register the scene on the screen of your consciousness. What if you could only see the world through this little tiny hole? You would be inclined to say, the world is like this. And all of us would say, no, no, the world is like this. This person would say, no, no, it's like this. How come they keep insisting the world is like this? Because that's all they can see. They're limited in the scope of their ability to widen their perception about life and what's going on and what's happening simply because they don't have the vocabulary to understand. So they started working on vocabulary and immediately behavior started to change. Being able to see, being able to comprehend, oh now I see, oh now I understand the reason why. And as your education increases, that should be one of the major purposes for education is to help you see things you couldn't see before, comprehend what you couldn't comprehend before, see a future you couldn't see before, see beyond tomorrow you couldn't see before. See, that's a gift. Vocabulary. So keep working on your vocabulary. Now, here's another reason. 
Only from, with our present vocabulary can we express what's going on in our head, what's going on in our heart. You can't express beyond your present vocabulary.